Now, I promise I do have a pop culture reference coming up for those interested, but I'll start with a short introduction first. So, my name is Joe Robinson. I'm a tech writer at Rackspace, and I work mainly on our um, OpenStack documentation upstream, but I also write and edit our um, docs for our customers. Um, I have a background in grant writing, and I keep a blog up to date. And I'm going to talk about effective docs writing for new and experienced developers today. And let's see. Well, just to unpack that, um, effective docs writing is straightforward, it's clear, and it achieves the goal of having your readers walk away happy and satisfied that they've got the information they needed. Um, so if you've taken a glance at some documents before and you've thought, well, that word doesn't look right, this procedure could be better, um, then my aim is to give you some practical style information to help you improve and answer those questions. And to get away from, from buzzwords, just for a second, um, what I think is effective docs writing is documentation, and, sorry, what is effective writing style is information that you can rapidly apply to your work, that you can adapt to. And how I'm going to uh, show that is I'm going to use some very basic computer science to provide just a new perspective on some fairly common writing style rules that you might have seen or heard of before. Um, and I'm going to do that with some help from Squirrel Girl. <laughs> now, um, I'm a bit enthusiastic about comic books and comic script writing, and uh, I've recently picked up some issues of Squirrel Girl, and um, they're very good. Now, Squirrel Girl was created in 1992, and she's published by Marvel Comics. Uh, the current writer is a guy called Ryan North, who's famous for dinosaur comics, and at the moment, he's got Squirrel Girl studying computer science at college. The art team is Jacob Charbot, Erica Henderson, and Rico Renzi, and the letterer is a gentleman called Travis Lanham. Now, Travis has done a really good job of bringing to life computer science in the lettering, which is the content in the word balloons of the comic. And let's see, uh, just where Squirrel Girl is in her education at the moment, she's hit that point where she can start applying concepts that she's heard of in her classes and adapt them to the real world. So here's one panel I want to focus on. So here we can see um, she's using an if statement. And the lettering has changed to resemble some basic code. And you can see her explaining to Dr. Octopus here. Um, and you, know, she's, you can tell she's a good hero because she's borrowing from Spider-Man's rogues gallery. Um, that she's, and that she's got a good grasp of basic if statements. And she's really enthusiastic about what she's learning. Now, here's that code close up. And she's saying, if, we, if I leave you alone, we won't fight. But um, if I don't, otherwise, we're going to fight. So to focus in on what she's saying here, and to tie that back to the talk, um, she's adapting simple computer science and using that as a branch towards the complex. And that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to use this computer science perspective to give you some writing style rules that help you, that can help you to adapt towards more complex, sorry, that can help you to adapt towards better um, documentation writing. So let's start with some definite articles. So, defi oh wait, no, sorry, before I continue, um, I just wanted to say that uh, one uh, knowledge assumption that I'll make at the outset is that uh, everyone's aware that nouns are naming words and verbs are action words. And that's the only bit of assumed knowledge that I'll have starting off. So back to definite articles. Uh, definite articles are words like a and the, and some documentations might omit these words or not understand how to use them correctly. And uh, just to go into the definition, um, well, the exact definition rather, they're words that accompany nouns. Uh, they can state when a noun is general or if it's specific. And they're classed as determiners. That's the uh, technical word for them. But here's that definition as code. So if you have a specific noun, use the. 
otherwise use a or an. Now I've got a few examples that we can run through quickly from the OpenStack documentation. So with that code in mind, Kickstart is a tool. So we're using a there because Kickstart is just a tool. We're referring to it in general terms. Launchpad, the collaboration site. So it's a specific site and we're using the to refer to it specifically. So moving on to another point and also a fairly basic writing style rules uh, set is about commas. So commas are a really important part of writing. Um, the being a specific punctuation mark that can use to break up a sentence. Because sentences are a single thought between each full stop. And well, having said that, they are a simple thought, but you can have more complex sentences that house multiple thoughts. But that's where punctuation comes in. So they can help break up those ideas so it's more clear to your reader what's going on. So how do you know how to use a comma? Well, they separate out, they separate out introductory clauses. They set aside subordinate phrases or clauses as side information and they can separate two equal clauses that are divided by a conjunction word, which is or, but, or and. Now, I've started to use words like phrase and clause here, and we're just, just going to pin that up for a minute, but I promise we'll come back to that because that's parts of a sentence that we'll get to later. So here's the comma rules as code. If you have an introductory phrase, an aside, or before a conjunction, that's this type of sentence, use a comma. Otherwise, use a full stop or another, another kind of punctuation mark. So here's some examples. With an introductory phrase, like in this example, a sentence needs a comma to separate that out. Uh, the sender example, you can see the comma aside. It's also called a comma pair, where we've got aside information, still relevant to the sentence, but separated out with two commas. In the third example, we've got the conjunction but separating two independent clauses, which have expressed two separate independent ideas. So I've been talking about sentences, and we're going to move on to another way to construct sentences, which comes up pretty commonly, and that's passive and active voice. Um, passive voice is tricky, it's kind of hard to recognize and triage and deal with, and it's one of those things that is easy to glaze over. It's like your reader's reading it and they can kind of lose track of what's going on in the sentence because of the passive voice. And one definition I'd read about in my research was that if you think a sentence has passive voice, check to see if the thing or person doing the action can be removed and if the meaning remains the same. But I thought, well, that's really not very good. So. I thought about what's some of the advice that editors that I'd spoken to back at university or in um, just general editing work had said before about how to identify passive voice, how do we triage it? And some of the examples that I could remember they were saying for a practical and effective way to pick up on it, passive voice uses the past tense, a past participle, which is the ed ending, as in waited, wanted, desired, and passive voice contains form, some form of the verb to be, such as is, am, are. And then you can ask who's doing the action after you've checked on these two style rules. So here's that as code. Search for the verb to be, past tense, and then look for the subject. If you can find those, it's most likely passive voice. Otherwise, it's most likely, likely active voice. Um, let's look at some examples. Yep. So, extra drivers need to be installed by the user later on. Verb to be, past tense form of installed with the ED ending, and then identifying an actor, there it is, user. The users are installing extra drivers later on. Contributions made to the Linux kernel must be finalized before release. So we've got form of the verb to be, past tense of finalized. And in that one, it's kind of trickier who's doing the action. It's a bit more blasé, but I will go a bit deeper into that. And that's because the passive voice isn't all that bad. Sometimes it can be used 
to draw attention to a specific part of the sentence that you want to emphasize. In this case, contributions. That's the key part that we want to make clear here. If we switch that to the active, it might sound way more adversarial, like we need these contributions done before release. So we've got an adversarial figure, we, asking for contributions. So that's just an example of how the passive voice can sometimes be useful as well. So continuing on, going a bit deeper towards sentence level editing and sentence level style rules, plain language. Now, plain language is a movement that started in the public service in the 1970s, and it's an idea that involves recruiting just a limited vocabulary and using shorter sentences. Um, it's important to talk about, though, that while plain language does sound beneficial and helpful, um, it can be just as constraining as, uh, say, relying on a specific set of words or it's like sentences must be this length in our documentation. So it needs to be combined with the key rule that we, or the key bit of advice that we've talked about several times today, and that's to know your audience. So you need to uh, think about that question, who is your audience? But yeah, as I said, uh, sentence length is a consideration. And in order to like start employing some plain language, you can think about the sentence length and varying the word number, because this can increase the clarity and the simplicity of the doc overall. Hmm. I've found in my own writing that adjusting and limiting the sentence length every so often, not for every single sentence, because shorter sentences can make your document feel really like sharp and choppy, and the meaning is a little bit harder to get out, so it's better to vary. And there's no hard rule about when to vary, but you, what you can do is to count some of the words, or choose a sentence, choose a paragraph, a sentence within a paragraph, and count up the words in each one, and just see what those numbers balance out to. Okay, here's that as code. Uh, if you're checking the style and the docs don't sound right, or they don't address audience needs, then you can adjust the sentence length. <coughs> Otherwise, you can employ another review strategy if that's not working out. So on to another part of building sentences is concrete and abstract word choices. So plain language needs kind of more of a concrete vocabulary to work properly. So in technical writing, though, this is much more of a challenge because uh, it's debatable how concrete and abstract words like installation and cloud are. It definitely dif differs by discipline and, fi and the field that you're in. But it's worthwhile thinking about how to classify words as concrete or abstract in general. It's a step towards improving your writing style overall. For concrete and abstract, think about how readily you can perceive or come into contact with what you're writing about in your word choice. Think about if what you're describing can be picked up or if it's more conceptual. Translation teams, uh, just as an aside, also benefit more from having concrete words over abstract in writing. So here's that as code. If you're thinking about concrete over abstract, think of people, places, objects, things you can touch. Otherwise, abstract words represent actions, ideas, concepts, states of mind. So having spoken about passive voice, about sentence length, about abstract words, uh, I just wanted to touch on to finish up uh, sentences in general and future directions. Just to return to that point from earlier and perhaps lay down some points that you can pursue in the future if this interests you. So um, I was talking about um, sentences having uh, one or two ideas in them, and that plain language kind of prescribes simple and shorter, but don't feel that you have to abandon long sentences altogether. This is uh, just a starting point of something to think about. And uh, so to start off with, um, the most practical and effective way to think about sentences is to think about subjects and predicates. 
so the subject is the part of the sentence that is contains the person or the thing taking action and the predicate describes the action for example writers write or you install software in writers write writers is the subject the predicate is the word write you install software you is the subject the predicate is the phrase install software so that's the basic concept of a sentence and let's see yeah I think to finish up um, I'll just talk about a quote from M Arnold and M Arnold says um, for improving writing style in general you have something to say and you say it as clearly as you can otherwise maybe don't follow the advice find another review strategy but um, what Arnold is elucidating here is that uh, writing style for tech writing uh, needs some clarity overall. It needs a little bit of simplicity. It comes from paying attention to words. It comes from checking on your articles, whether your words are abstract or concrete. Um, it means starting to adapt some of these basic ideas to slowly move towards more complex sentence construction ideas. And also, getting to the point where you are aware of um, mistakes like using the word elucidate at the end of a talk. So, thanks very much and Thank you very yeah. much, Joe. Yeah, and um, if there's, depending on the question level, I've got some FAQs to go through just to bring us up to time. So, um, are there any questions to kick off though? Yes. Hi, um, how do you know when, uh, sorry, I've got a document that I'm writing at the moment and I'm not a technical writer. Mm -hmm. uh, but for example, in, in that document, I will say, uh, ensure that you're um, on master and then create a branch. Uh, and I'm guessing from your slides, that's the subject. How is it good to include the subject or omit it in technical writing when giving directions? So alternatively, I could say like, um, check out master and mm -hmm. then branch. Okay, um, it depends if you want to have, because it sounds like that's in the second person, so you're saying uh, check out master, then you can do the thing. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, other documentation I've written in the past, um, the word you hasn't appeared at all. Mm. So it's surprising to me. So there were seven uh, engineers working on this document and then I went and refactored it over a yeah. day last week and I went back to reread it and noticed I was directing the subject what to do the whole time. And yeah. is that better to omit that, or is it, is it actually nicer for the end user to, to see the direction towards them? Um, well, some style guides say it's OK. Um, I know p for the OpenStack docs, we like to write to you um, and include like the second person in there. Um, I depends on your audience as well, but um, yeah, it's, it's hard to pick up on like a hard rule for that one, but it's good that you've identified subject and predicate though. That's great. But be consistent, I think, would be the one thing. Yeah. You don't want to swapping between things as you go. Yeah. Yeah. And probably time for one more quick one. Mine follows on from your question. Um, I tend to use, I struggle between using you mm. and we. Yes. When it's guiding someone through a lot of steps and there's a lot of stuff to go through, mm -hmm. next you can do this or, or we'll need to do this next. Is there any better way to, or not to do it, or? Um, I was just thinking about the, the, um, hmm, that's a good one. It's I like always steer clear of I, because it's not about me, it's about you. Yeah. Well, it's like, um. Trying to engage the person. Yeah. No, that's a really good question. I might have to look that up, because um, just off the top of my head, though, it's, um, I think the case to use we is when we're saying something like we recommend you do this, like you're uh, you're the the um, you're the producer of the content and you're talking to someone. Um, yeah, it's like saying we together. It's kind of like um, just trying to pass that out. It's like, well, are we we're install we're, we're installing this together, but we're not. It's you're you're reading instructions on how to install it, install it, and you're doing it yourself. Mm. 
Yeah, there was one more question over here, if there's time. Oh, a comment. So, so I have a comment Caution. on that. I, um, I'm, not a, I not, I'm not an expert, mm. and not even a night to speaker. So that, uh, but to me, it is important to, uh, to write we in a sentence. It is important to know who, what the meaning of that is. Mm. So you, you, sure. you, it needs to be clear who, what group you are describing as we, right? Because mm. sometimes it is yeah. not so. Yeah, oh, that's right. It's um, being aware of who the subject is in a sentence is really important. It's a good basic point to start from because you can start to move towards the complex of like, what person is this in? Um, how long should these sentences be? Other style rules build off foundations like that. So yeah, it's a good start. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again, Joe. Oh, thank you. All right, and in just a minute or two, once we do a changeover, we are going to hear from Nicola. So our last talk of the day.